I've got the pleasure of welcoming uh, now Dr. Imogen Cavadino, um, who will be talking to us about her PhD and the work that she did on recording in British Gardens. I've known Imogen for a number of years now, and I've had the pleasure of being on some of her slug identification courses, which have honestly been some of the best courses, uh, natural history courses I've ever attended. So it's with, yeah, I really can't wait for this talk, Imogen, so I'm going to shut up and let <laughs> you get on. All right, cheers. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Kieran said, I'm mainly going to be talking about my PhD research today, which is all about um, slugs, recording slugs in gardens, um, using citizen science particularly. Um, so you might notice slugs are not insects, um, but we often do get lumped in with entomology. So um, it's quite fun to be here again talking on an ento live talk about something that is not an insect. Um, anyway, without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce a little bit about what we already knew about slugs in Britain when I started my PhD in 2018. Then I'm going to move on to the RHS cellar slug hunt and then talk about the Slugs Count project. A little bit about questions that have kind of come out of my PhD research that would be really interesting for either myself or someone else to answer in the future. And also talk a little bit about how you can actually get involved to provide really useful data. First of all, who am I? Well, I first got into slugs when I was doing a natural talent traineeship on non-marine mollusks at the National Museum of Cardiff in 2016 to 2017. Um, and this was all learning how to identify terrestrial and freshwater slug and snail species, uh, along with freshwater bivalves as well. Um, this then coincidentally led on to me doing a my PhD, which I've just completed, which was on slug and snail diversity in gardens. Um, and the quality of the work we've produced from this has been recognised by a few awards, which is really exciting. Um, but also since starting my PhD, I've become an ordering council member for the Conchological Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about them later on. Uh, but basically, I'm a little bit slug mad and it's been a really fun few years working on this project. And um, I'm really excited to share some of the results for you. So first of all, I'm going to talk about why, why slugs? Why is the Royal Horticultural Society a gardening charity? Why did they decide to fund a PhD on slugs? Well, slugs have long been considered a problem for gardeners. As far back as 1600, if not earlier, we have accounts from, from manuscripts and things like that, people talking about slugs as pests in gardens and coming up with novel ways to control them. The RHS is a membership charity. So also, if you become a member, you have the the right to ask absolutely any gardening question you you wish to the charity and over since the 1960s they've actually kept track of um what inquiries are sent in and slugs regularly appear in the top 10 most inquired about garden problems so they're obviously a huge concern to gardeners and this hasn't reduced so they're really of concern to gardeners however despite this they are surprisingly understudied especially in gardens and this is really important because as we've progressed as a society, we've, we're looking more and more at finding more sustainable ways to manage slugs in gardens and also just to get a better understanding rather than just thinking of them as a single organism that causes problems. Adding to that, we also have the challenge that new species constantly appear to be arriving and establishing in Britain. So when the Slugs of Britain and Ireland FSC aid gap key was created in 2014 there was a whole range of um, scientific research undertaken to underpin this and um, during that that they actually discovered that there's 20 percent more species established in britain than they thought um, so it really is a dynamic dynamic fauna that's changed a lot in, in recent years um, partly through taxonomic change but also just through species arriving and establishing here so there's a lot of a lot of uh, information to try and unpick so it's currently considered that we have about 44 species of slug present in Britain. There's a little bit of a taxonomic debate about some of these. And, and you can see from this image that they can vary quite significantly in adult size um, and also have different colours and patterns. But there's also a bit of an overlap. So it can be quite challenging for people to recognise individual species of slugs, particularly with no training. On top of that, the public opinion of slugs is 
very poor. Generally, most gardeners think of the slug as in this popular image here, where you know you've got a head end, you've got a bum end, and all of your lovely vegetables are in the stomach. But we also have scientific evidence that a slugs are generally regarded as by society as quite a negative thing. So it's been rated as less useful, less smart, and less lovable than all other animals in one study. And in another study, 44% of the adult population in the UK reported disgust around slugs and 10% reported anxiety. So we know that really even the general public outside of gardeners uh, are not a big fan. So, but despite this, we decided um, to think about my PhD as an opportunity for anyone, absolutely anyone with a garden to help us learn more about the slugs within them. So in the end, this evolved into two different projects. We have the RHS Cellar Slug Survey, which ran from March 2019 to October 2021. And this was an open project for absolutely anyone could submit a record via the platform iRecord of the cellar slug um, or any of the target species. The other project that evolved after this was the Slugs Count project. And this was quite a different structured citizen science project in that it was quite closed participation. So we recruited and limited it to 60 participants who then went out regularly throughout a whole year from October 2020 to October 2021, collecting slugs once every four weeks um, uh, to give us a really good picture of what's actually happening in gardens. But also just to get the public on board, we created two giant inflatable slugs, um, which we then took out to the RHS shows in 2019 um, and other events as well. Um, and these were really good attention grabbers, just getting people in to have a conversation about slugs and to also give them then a leaflet about the Cellar Slug Survey and to encourage them to take part. Um, so this led to some really positive interactions. Which leads us on nicely to the RHS Cellar Slug Survey, also known as the RHS Cellar Slug Hunt. So the reason why we chose the cellar slugs is there's quite an interesting story to tell. So the yellow cellar slug at the top there is not, a, not considered a native species, but it has been present in Britain since at least 1600s, if not before. So it's been here a very long time. Um, however, since then, there's very sparse records of this species. And since then, in the 1960s to 1970s, the green cellar slug was recognised as being present in mainland Britain, having been present on the island before that. And what seemed to be happening was the green cellar slug spread quite rapidly across Britain, and we were still seeing very few yellow cellar slugs. So there's concern that maybe the green cellar slug was replacing the yellow cellar slug. So we thought, well, it's a really good opportunity to get the public out there looking for these species to give us a really clear snapshot of where they actually are now. But it's also a valuable way of engaging the public with slugs as part of garden biodiversity because often people just think of slugs as a pest something to get rid of whereas what's really interesting about the three slugs on this leaflet here is that they are considered detritivores meaning that they feed only on decaying plant material dead animals or or other rotting matter um, and they don't feed on live plant material so they actually have potential benefits for gardeners it was also a really nice way of getting people to think about mollusk declines and also the spread of non-native or invasive species, um, which often people, again, people just wouldn't consider when it comes to a slug. And the reason it worked quite well for us as a citizen science project is these species generally can be identified from photographs. So that means we can generate some really useful data on distributions by just asking people to take a photograph and to submit that. Um, but we also asked for a lot more information as well so that we can try and get a really good picture of the habitat that these slugs are in within a garden. So what we found is we managed to get just over a thousand records submitted to the um, to the project via the iRecord survey form. Of these, 867 were able to be identified from photos, so that's about 84% of records, which wasn't too bad. Uh, we did have to follow up quite a lot of records without photos. Um, some of these we did manage to get photos and others we didn't. Um, and I'll kind of mention at a moment why this was so important. What was kind of confirmed what we suspected, the green cellar slug was much more commonly encountered and much more abundant. So it represented 80% of the accepted records or just under 80%, I should say. Um, whereas the yellow cellar slug was still very scarce and rarely recorded with only 4% of records able to be confirmed as that species. 
We did have a few records of the leopard slug as well, which I included in the leaflet earlier. Um, and the reason why we included that as a separate species is because when we were talking to the guard gardeners and the general public about these these slugs often what we found they would say is oh i've seen that in my garden i just thought it was a funny colored leopard slug um so people were kind of a little bit aware of them being there but they hadn't really realized they were a separate species so we in included that as a non-target species as well in case people encountered it um particularly as they can also occur in similar habitat and areas of the garden but what I think also really was interesting thing to come out of this project was we had the 10% in light blue there, which is other species. So the recording form we used on iRecord was restricted just to the two cellar slug target species and also the non-target leopard slug species. So people could only submit records for those three species via this form. Um, and we actually had 10% of records that were completely different species. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, um, because it's really valuable for us as as verifiers on iRecord, but also as people who teach about slugs, who understand more about where the general public might be getting, uh, going wrong in making mistakes with identification. However, before I get into that, I just thought I'd talk about the positives to come out of COVID, which is a rare thing to hear about. Um, we were actually really benef benefited by COVID in a way because suddenly in 2020, the UK went into lockdown, everyone was told to stay at home and they suddenly were looking for activities to do. So going out at night or during the day to look for slugs in the garden, sun became an attractive thing to do. Um, so we actually saw quite a big spike in records during, during the COVID lockdowns. Um, and we also had quite a few virtual talks, talks like this one with large audiences and also the FSC BioLinks kindly included um, this cellar slug hunt as a course assignment as well. So we managed to get really good engagement from people. What this means is we now have um, these abundance records by month and year. However, this more likely reflects the number of humans recording rather than slug abundance itself, because we know that the cellar slugs can live for multiple years and they tend not to be that seasonal um, in their activity. Um, so it's actually doesn't tell us a huge amount about the species, sadly, but it tells us a lot about people and when they're out recording, which is quite interesting. So in terms of the species distributions, so in comparison to the ones published in the 2014 key of slugs, um, we noticed that we managed to get a much broader coverage for Limicus maculatus, so the green southern slug. However, it is worth pointing out that after the guide was published, record, slug recording came a lot easier because it is such a good resource and it made it a lot more accessible for people to go out and record slugs. Um, so generally, uh, our distribution was a little bit bigger, but um, it probably um, probably doesn't mean that the species has spread that rapidly since 2014. It probably just was recording gaps before that. Um, it's also worth pointing out that we have quite a high density of points around cities. And again, that's related to where people are and where they're recording. Uh, we did have some unusual new records as well, though. So some of the Scottish highland, uh, sorry, the islands of Scotland um, had records of the green cellar slug which appears to be the first record as well just showing how rapidly and far far reaching this slug has spread um since it was first um discovered in male and britain in the 1960s to 70s um so yeah so it seems to have spread quite quite well um it doesn't seem to have a particularly restricted distribution in britain at all in contrast, Limicus flavus, um, when you compare it to the 2014 distribution, it does seem a lot sparser. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work to do here in unpicking that to know whether it does actually represent a true decline or if it is just a case of it's always been fairly rarely recorded, but over over decades it's um, it's filled in a few gaps. It's, it's hard to say. Um, however, it does seem a much sparser distribution. What I think is quite interesting is that there's no obvious geographic limit here. We do have some species, uh, some records of the species from northern Scotland still, as well as further south. Um, so I'm not sure if climate necessarily is impacting the species. Um, yeah, and I think that there's also a lot to unpick about whether Limicus maculatus, so the green cellar slug, has actually replaced the yellow cellar slug, Limicus flavus, or if Limicus flavus has just always been a little bit scarcer. It's also worth pointing out that um, 
the green cell of slug is much more adaptable. It's it is associated with human habitation and gardens, but it's also able to colonize uh, semi-natural habitats, particularly things like woodland. Um, whereas the yellow cell slug has always been very strongly associated with human houses and habitation. Um, so another reason why it might be quite limited in distribution or maybe even reducing um, in abundance is probably to do with the fact that we as humans are actually improving our living conditions so making our houses much drier and warmer, which potentially doesn't benefit this species. However, there is also increasing evidence that these two species can actually hybridize and that the green cellar slug may be genetically dominant. So it may be the case that actually um, the green cellar slug is breeding the yellow slug out of existence in the UK a little bit. Um, but thankfully, we're still finding populations that appear to be clinging on. Um, so definitely some really more interesting research to, to do in that area. However, coming back to that blue 10% um, in the pie chart, so that was the species that had been submitted as cellar slugs, but actually upon examining the photographs, we realized they really weren't cellar slugs. Um, we had 191 records that we corrected the identification of, and of those that were misidentified as Limicus flavus, 74% were Limicus maculatus, um, which is kind of reassuring because it shows that people weren't far off, they were in the right genus at least, um, but potentially what it was, was they were so excited to potentially find a rare species that they were misrecording the common non-native species as the slightly rarer one. Um, but we did also have some, some surprises where things were in a different genus or uh, a different family, in fact. Um, so we had 11 records of uh, large round back slugs, um, so in the Aryan genus here. Most of those were actually yellow in colour, so it must be the case of people with minimal training, we're just seeing a yellow slug, getting a bit excited, taking a vote of it and submitting it as a yellow cellar slug, even though it was a completely different family. Uh, we also had some three band slugs. We had 11 records of that as well, um, which are actually in the same family as the cellar slugs, but they do have very different body color and some different markings as well. Also seven records of the leopard slug submitted as, as the yellow cellar slug. Um, Again, they have very different colours, but they do have similar patterns. So I can see perhaps where people were getting confused. Um, and also five records of the netted field slug, which is a little white fawn coloured slug that's very common in gardens. Um, so this is really interesting for us as, as teachers of slug identification to understand you know, where, where people are making these mistakes. Um, but it also, I think, illustrates the importance of providing good good levels of training for a citizen science project because with the cellar slug survey we we just handed out an id guide leaflet um, and we didn't provide any further training so it's fair enough that people wouldn't get it 100 right particularly if they'd never looked at slugs before so we kind of got this snapshot of the cellar slug and what we started to think about after that was actually that's not telling us a huge amount about the slugs in our garden still. What we really want to know is more about the faunas within our gardens and how this, this varies between gardens and measure this different species diversity of slugs within British gardens themselves. And that's where the Slugs Count project came in. So we actually based the methodology of the Slugs Count project on that of Barnes and Weil, which was published in 1944 and 1945. So this appeared to be the last kind of full in-depth study of slugs in gardens. So these two gentlemen investigated 21 gardens in 1942 and 47 gardens in 1943. These are all neighbouring gardens in Harpenden, Hertfordshire, which is near the Rothamsted Institute where they were working. They carried out nighttime searches for 30 minutes using a torch and collected any active slugs they found. They didn't search under any logs or move any objects or disturb any foliage to find, find slugs. They just literally collected what they could find on the ground moving around. Um, they also experimented with surveying at different times and successive nights in the gardens, which gave us quite a lot of information about the ecology of slugs at that time, when species were active, when they're not active. Um, so this allowed us to kind of design a methodology that could be uh, uh, broadened out to cover the whole of Britain, but also to involve citizen scientists as well. Helpfully, they also provided some really detailed descriptions of the species they were finding, which is quite important when you're struggling with things like taxonomic changes to actually understand 
potentially to be able to compare and understand how distributions of species or abundances of species in gardens may have changed since then. So we decided to take this method and scale it up across the whole UK, like I said. And we decided to advertise the project and try and recruit 60 participants who would then train up to basically go and collect slugs for us. We thought this would be a really difficult sell and that we would really struggle to fill 60 spaces, but actually we had just under 3,000 applications. So really blown away by that. Um, and it made it quite hard to actually select who we wanted to take part by that point. So what we decided to do is aim for really good broad geographic coverage. And you can see the green dots on this map of the UK shows where our participants were. We focused on mainland Britain because the island faunas can be slightly different. Um, we want to make sure we can compare between the sites. This is quite exciting because it was in potentially the first in-depth study of slug species in gardens since the 1940s. We designed the study to last a whole year. So we asked people to go out for once every four weeks for a whole year to use this using a standardized method of searching by torch for 30 minutes along a set route they decided on in their garden um, and collecting like Barnes and Wild, collecting everything they saw that was active. So not searching through leaf litter or foliage or under objects um, just so that we could try and standardize it as much as possible. We provided training and included including a, providing a key for the slugs of Britain and Ireland from the FSC. Um, and we then asked participants to have a go at identifying the slugs themselves before posting them into the lab for verification. Um, so they would have a go at identifying all the slugs at home. They'd pop them in the post. I'd receive them in the lab and re-identify them. So this is essentially meant we ended up with two data sets, one of the participants' identifications and one of my identifications, which made sure that we had really robust biological recording data. And we knew that the species they thought were there were actually there or, or not, um, but also gave us quite a unique opportunity, again, to look at accuracy and understanding how accurately the public can actually identify slugs. So here are a few headline figures. We, throughout the year, we found 32 species of slug, um, and this was represented by 2000, uh, sorry, 20,373 specimens. Uh, we did actually collect slightly more than that, but I haven't included the survey one data in this because we changed the methodology slightly. Uh, we had and we recruited 60, but one person dropped out straight away. So we're left with 59 participants. And by the end of the project, we'd actually managed to keep that at 57. So we did really well. And I'm super happy that so many people stuck with us for the whole year um, and managed to collect so many slugs for us. Um, and it's honestly provided us with a huge amount of data and information. Uh, we've recently updated, uh, uploaded these records to the MBN Atlas, so they should be appearing up there soon as well. So if anyone wants to go and have a look at the data, it should be around. So I'm just going to run through a few key findings about the ecology and diversity. There was a lot we did with this, so I'm just going to summarise a few points. Um, we found that temperature was a good predictor of slug abundance with higher temperature equaling more slugs, which was not surprising because there was a lot of previous literature showing that this was the case. This could have implications for as our winters get warmer, we might see more slugs active over the winter months. Um, however, what was really surprising is we saw that some slugs were active in below freezing air temperatures. So we had one occasion where it was minus five degrees air temperature and the participant collected, I think it was 22 slugs representing at least, I think, six or seven species. Um, and what was really interesting was in that case, it turned out to be that they were collected from a wall that had been warmed by the sun during the daytime. So although the air temperature was freezing cold, um, those little microclimates and microhabitats within the garden had allowed those slugs to be active. Um, so it just goes to show how potentially things like urban warming might affect how slugs can be active um, in the future. What was another really interesting thing we found was there's no strong geographic trends in species diversity. So you can see this on the map here where we've used the Shannon Diversity Index, which is just a, a mathematical formula that takes into account the number of species and the abundances of the numbers of individuals within that species to calculate how diverse a site is, with zero being the lowest and 2.49 in this case being the highest. And you can see that this is all quite randomly dispersed. There's no obvious north-south divide or anything like that it's all quite random looking um 
And this is unexpected because we suspected that there would be lower diversity in northern Britain, where the temperature is traditionally much colder. Um, and southern Britain would probably have higher diversity because we assume that with most invertebrates, that's where they establish first. Um, but actually what we saw was it was quite varied. Um, and I think that's a lot to do with how slugs potentially are spread within Britain, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. However, we did also ask people about the structures in their gardens because gardens are very artificial managed habitats. Um, and so we asked people to tell us things like how much lawn, how, many, how much flower bed, um, whether they had areas of long grass, and if so, what what area, what size areas, things like that, to see whether they have any impact on on species diversity. Um, we couldn't find any relationship between the size of these features and slug diversity, um, but that might be because we only had sixty sites, and every garden is so unique and different that there just wasn't enough data to actually tell us that tell us whether those relationships were there. However, what we found is if we then converted that data into a count of simple categories, so if we say, you know, a fence counts as one, a flower bed counts as one, the gardens with the highest number of features, so the most kind of diverse range of habitats within them, actually had quite a strong relationship with having higher species, slug, uh, slug species diversity in them. Whereas gardens that had very few things in them, so say it was mostly dominated by a short lawn, um, tended to have lower species diversity. Um, I should point out that none of the gardens in our study had things like artificial turf, or um, though we did have some that were quite paved. Um, so it'd be really interesting to explore whether that, what effect that has on slug faunas um, in future. Another really surprising outcome for us was that the fauna of slugs in gardens is now very strongly dominated by non-native species. So we're seeing a lot more non-native species in our gardens than before. Um, and interestingly, older gardens were found to contain a larger abundance of native species. So these could be quite good preserves of our native faunas potentially. So I just thought I'd show you what the 10 most abundant slugs found in our garden look like. Um, so at least the top six or so are relatively even in terms of the proportion of slugs that they make up. I should point out that there's a lot of seasonal variation and there may also be some slight geographic variation for some of the species as well. But these are the 10 most common ones that we found. So of course, what the feedback we got from our participants is that they wanted, to, as keen gardeners, some of them, they wanted to know a bit more about these species and, you know, particularly whether, whether some of these are pests or not. So we could actually apply from what we know from the Slugs of Britain and Ireland key to, to answer this. So the species on this slide with an orange leaf next to them are considered minor plant pests, meaning that they will damage plants. Um, but generally considered to a fairly low level. Whereas those with red next to their names are considered major plant pests, so to cause large amounts of plant damage. Those with green are considered benign, so they don't damage live plants at all. And those with, uh, those with blue, sorry, are unknown. So we just don't know enough about these species to know whether they damage our plants or not. And it's quite interesting, I think, that two of the species in our top 10, we just don't know enough about their ecology and their feeding habits to know whether they are potentially a pest in gardens. I should point out that this pest status is based on reviewing lots of literature. Um, so Ben Rosen reviewed quite a lot of the literature when he created the guide. And most of that is based on agriculture. So there may be some differences with how much damage these species actually do do in gardens. Another really interesting thing about this top 10 is five of the 10 species are non-native, so they're completely not native to Britain. Um, and actually, most of these five are fairly recent introductions. So the tramp slug at the top there was, I think, introduced in the 1930s or 1940s. Um, the Ambergliamax species there, which is actually a complex of two species that are very difficult to separate without dissection. Um, they've been present outdoors since the 1980s. And they, um, having established first in glass houses in the 1930s to 1940s as well, 
Um, and then the green status flag, as I've already talked about, has been present in Britain since the 60s or 70s. Um, and the other two species are fairly recent introductions as well. Um, so we are seeing, although they've been introduced fairly recently, they are now some of the most abundant slugs in our gardens. Um, and also we did find a very strong relationship between the number of species and the number of sites. So generally, um, these species are pretty widespread. So if they're very abundant, um, they tend to be quite widespread across Britain as well. Though there are some exceptions. And when we compare this to the data from the 1940s put together by Barnes and Vile, what also is quite striking is actually five of these top 10, sorry, six of these top 10 even, were not present during their study at all. So they didn't find them in any of their gardens that they sampled. Um, for species like the, the tramp slug at the top there, that's, it's, it's potentially not that surprising, but it was introduced to Britain in the 1930s, so it might not have become widespread. Um, it might not have reached Harpenden by the time that Barnes and Wiles did their study, but it does get illustrate potentially how quickly the species may have spread. Um, whereas things like the three band slug and the cellar slug wouldn't have been present at that time anyway. Um, so it just shows like how rapidly things potentially have changed. Of course, there might be some regional variation. It might be that, you know, that area just didn't have those species at that time. Um, but we did try and include that in the analysis as well. So we tried to look at our closest sites compared to Barnes of Wild as well. And it did show a very similar trend. So what we can kind of say now is that species found in British gardens has changed a lot since the 1940s, with non-native species becoming much more dominant. So we're seeing a lot more non-native species in gardens. Interestingly, slug species diversity has actually increased. We have a lot more species present in our gardens than Barnes and Wild found in their study. There may be some regional variation in that. Um, however, what's also really interesting alongside this is although in this time of biodiversity declines, it seems like slugs are doing really well. We've seen increased diversity. We're actually seeing decreased abundance. So if you compare the amount of slugs that Barnes and Wild found within a 30 minute search to the amounts we were finding in a 30 minute search, we were finding significantly less slugs. And that's really quite fascinating. Um, so yeah, we're working on trying to get that published at the moment because I think it's a really interesting find. Um, and we did do this analysis both at local and national levels. So compared the data sets in different ways to make sure that, you know, this was confirmed <laughs> uh, when we're looking kind of like for light sample sizes as well. Um, yeah, so overall, when we look at all the slugs found um, in Barnes and Weil, 86% of them were, were native, whereas in slugs count, 49% were native. So there's definitely a, a large shift that's happened. However, not everything's done really well. So just pulling out one particular species here. So this is Tandonia budapestensis or the Budapest keeled slug, which has been present in Britain for a very long time. However, it is considered a non-native species and is also a major pest of root vegetables. In the 1940s, it represented 21% of all the slugs they found. Um, but in our study, it represented just 1% of slugs. So potentially this species may have been which uh, may be declining, um, which is quite interesting. However, it's worth bearing in mind, again, we're looking at very different geographical scales. So we were looking at the whole of the UK, Barnes and Wild were looking at one, one site really in Harpenden. Um, so there may be some differences, but I think it's really interesting highlighting this as, you know, an opportunity for someone to go in and look at all the historic records and the current records and to figure out what's going on here. It may be that this, species has been impacted by the change in the way we garden. So during the 1940s, they very much would have been gardening, growing vegetables for the war, for the war effort. Um, and if this is a pest of vegetables, perhaps that did really well at that time, whereas now perhaps it's not doing quite so well. But it may also be things like climate changes impacting this species. Though we did have some species that showed no or little change. So we had the spotted false keeled slug was quite rare in the 1940s and uh, continues to be rare in gardens today. The leopard slug potentially has a slight increase, but probably not that, that significant at all. Um, so it seems to remain quite stable. And the yellow cellar slug, 
it was very rare in the 1940s studies and continued to be very rare in our study as well. So again, it kind of leads back to the SLS survey and the potential that maybe we need to look at this species in a little bit more detail to understand whether it is just simply a rarely recorded species or if there is something happening with declines here. So that was the slug species themselves. Um, so another area I was really interested in was actually looking at accuracy. So how accurately can citizen scientists actually identify slugs? And um, because we had two unique data sets where we had participants identifications versus my identifications, we could kind of use that to come up with a, a proportion of misidentifications. So to kind of look at how much material was misidentified um, within a survey. So that's basically what this chart showing here. So at the bottom, you've got the number of surveys, which starts at two because we've disregarded survey one because of some changes in methodology. And then on the, the uh, other axis, you've got between naught and one, one being 100%, zero being 0%. So 0% meaning that the, no one made any mistakes. Everyone identified everything absolutely perfectly. Um, and 100% meaning that they got it all wrong. And reassuringly, you'll notice that all the lines on this chart are at neither end. So no one was 100% accurate, but no one was 100% wrong either. So that's really interesting. So what we actually did was we considered prior experience. So when we were recruiting, we asked participants to self-identify which level of experience they felt they had with slug, slug identification prior to the project start. Um, and so we've got the green on this graph, which is none. They had no experience of identifying slugs at all. Uh, purple or pink is beginner, so they had some kind of beginner level of experience, and then we've had to actually group all the other categories to more experienced because we had so few people who had actually had experience of identifying slugs um, before, um, which I mean is very in typical of the group because they're not a very popular group to record. Um, so, so yeah, so we had to group the, that smaller group into into a more experienced category. So if you look at these three lines, you'll see that they kind of zigzag or cross each other. Um, but hopefully you can see that there is a slight downward trend. So as it gets to 13, that the lines get a little bit lower. You can see that the proportion is getting slightly smaller. So over time, proportion of mis misidentification did decrease, which indicates that people were improving in their, their ability to identify slugs. What was really fascinating for me is that there were no significant differences between the experienced groups. So you can see that the green, the pink and the orange completely overlap. Um, they often, one overtakes the other. Um, and what we fully expected to see was that the more experienced people would start out really, really accurate and just consistently stay that way throughout the whole project. Whereas those people with some uh, no experience would start out really inaccurate and get much better. Um, and this didn't really seem to be the case. It seemed to kind of come down a lot more to individuals. Um, and maybe where we went wrong was asking people to categorize themselves um, because maybe some people overestimated their ability and maybe other people underestimated their ability um, through no fault of their own. It's just people fit, may feel... So I know some experts who would never categorize themselves in the, as an expert, um, but there might, might also be some beginners who maybe assume that they have a bit more knowledge than they do as well. So it could work both ways. Um, so again, it's kind of more an inter interesting aspect of human behavior and how this can affect recording. And what we did notice actually was the improvement in accuracy was very much driven by the number of surveys that people did, not the ex experience they had before they came into the project. So throughout the, the project, basically, if they did more surveys, they got more experience and they got slightly more accurate. So this has left us with, this project's kind of left us with some unanswered questions that unfortunately we didn't have time to investigate fully. And I just thought I'd highlight some of those. Um, one of these was identifying some of the cryptic non-native species. So for example, the Ambigliac species on this slide, known as the three band slug. This is a complex of two different species that have been present in Britain for a long time. Um, so outdoors since the 1980s, but indoors since the 1940s. Um, and there's kind of been a bit of a debate for many years about if you can if you can actually separate these two species using external features, and it we kind of come around to the idea that you probably can't. Um, so that leads to a challenge for 
people starting with slug recording and um, particularly members of the public like how can you actually start recognizing and separating these species because you can't fully expect the public to start dissecting specimens um, so what we actually decided to do is we decided to put that to the test. So we collaborated with the FSC Biolinks project and we ran a few dissection workshops where we brought in material, we provided training, and then we got a few enthusiastic individuals to help us try and dissect specimens so that we can try and separate out this, this species um, and actually see what the distributions are like and whether they overlap. Um, we, unfortunately, we didn't get very far with this. Um, partly because it's, it's quite a hard sell getting the public to come in and dissect slugs and um, but also we just kind of ran out of time in the end um, but it was a really fun pilot and um, it did work quite well people did pick up the skills quite quickly and one of the other things that kind of came out of people collecting was we noticed there was a lot of potential hybrids coming in we know that many slug species will hybridize um, but this makes it very challenging again for people recording slugs to know which ID characters are reliable, because when you get two species hybridizing, these species, these uh, characters may overlap, um, or some characters may be inherited, but that from one parent and not the other. So that leaves us with some really interesting questions of how can we actually distinguish between hybrids and native species? But also leads to the question, are hybrid species becoming more common? We've had a lot of anecdotal comments about how the large Aran species at the top of this slide, people remember from their childhood having lots of big black ones everywhere. And now they see red red ones and also now they see a lot more of the brown ones. It's possible that see these brown ones might be um, a non-native species Aran vulgaris that's come in, but there's also increasing evidence from Germany that what these species can hybridize um, and it might actually be changing the genetic makeup of populations. Um, so really interesting, complicated questions there. But of course, the thing we have to ask is, does this matter? Is this a problem? In this case, potentially it could be because our native species, Arin Ata and Arin Rufus, are considered minor plant pests. So they're considered to do some damage to plants, but not a significant amount. Whereas the non-native species that is potentially hybridizing with them, Arin vulgaris, is considered a major plant pest. So if it's transferring its traits over to our native species, we might find that the, this species complex in gardens becomes a bit more damaging to plants. However, that might not be the case at all. It could even walk, uh, work the other way where our native species genes are watering down the invasive species genes, and maybe they're not gonna be that big a problem. We just don't know. Um, and it's a very complicated question to, to unpick. Another unanswered question, a very big one that we're left with is also how are these species being introduced and spreading across Britain, um, particularly these non-native species. Um, we know that they can come in through things like the horticultural trade um, and even through plant nurseries, um, people moving plants around within Britain may move them around. But there's also a lot of evidence that they can also hitchhike on things like shipping, shipping containers and other traded goods. And one of the reasons why we might be seeing so many more species establishing is because global trade has become such a huge thing. Um, we are seeing more and more goods shipped around. Um, so there's more and more opportunity for things like slugs and snails to actually hitchhike on objects. Um, so I'm really interested in understanding more about how these species arrive and how they're actually spread within the country when they get here and what measures we can actually take to prevent this, which is a huge question, um, particularly as slugs and snails are not limited to any particular host plant like some other organisms might be. Um, so they, they, it's very easy for them to move and establish, as well as the fact that they're hermaphrodites, so it's not very hard to find a reproductive partner. Um, I was quite lucky to get some funding from DEFRA during my PhD to actually carry out a, a literature review looking at this, um, which this is actually publicly available now on their online portal. So if you want to check that out, uh, it is quite a long document, but I've tried to make it as easy reading as po possible, just I um, kind of outlining what species have potential to arrive and also the pathways they might be using to get here. which kind of leads us on to how important it is to for us to understand more about the ecology of non-native slug species. There's just so many species that are now widespread here that we don't know enough about their life history traits. We don't know enough about what they eat. We don't know what impact they potentially could have on our ecosystem. 
For example, the green cellar slug, we know it's de detritivore. So is that necessarily a good thing for our garden ecosystems or is it could it potentially be a negative thing? There's some huge questions to ask around that as well. So hopefully that was whetted your appetite to learn a lot more about mollusks. And now you think slugs are super interesting. Um, so I just want to give a little plug here to the Conchological Society of Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, we run a range of hybrid indoor meetings. So they are both in person at the Natural History Museum, but also now streamed live online. We actually have one coming up this Saturday um, with a great talk by Robert Cameron about snails. Um, so he's going to be talking about, I think it's things to elements of the mythology and also how snails have been used by humans. So it should be a really fascinating talk. So if you're interested, um, you don't necessarily have to be a member to come along, check out our website and there's loads of details on there. Also where the speaker gives permissions, we have been uploading our talks to a YouTube channel. So if you wanna go and catch any of those recordings, they should be available there. It's worth noting that not all speakers are able to, to give us that permission. So it, it is worth attending the talks live if you can, um, because they don't always make it to YouTube. We also have lots of field meetings throughout the summer. So if you wanna come and have a go at actually finding mollusks in the field and recording them, please do come along to those. Uh, if you decide to join the society, you do get, um, I think it's three issues of Monosque World a year. And we also have a scientific journal that's recently become open access. So everyone can now access that for free. So yeah, please do come and support the society. We need all the membership we can get. Um, but if you actually want to start helping by recording slugs, there are ways to do that. Um, so if you prefer to use iNaturalist, we now absorb research grade records from there into our iRecord system. We much prefer that you do submit records directly to iRecord where people like Chris, Ben and myself will actually verify them. Um, and then Ben makes all those records accessible to the public eventually as well. But if you wanna start somewhere simple, the RHS Salad Slug Survey is closed for data collection for my PhD, but you can still submit records to iRecord and feel free to use the resources we create for there. Also, the National Museum of Wales have a project looking out for the ghost slug, and they've got some lovely ID guides for that as well. Um, so those are some more simple species to start with. And if you need any help, feel free to reach out via Twitter or through the Conchsoc. And there's also a Facebook group that's very active that can help you as well. Um, thank you very much for your time. And thank you to all the organizations who supported me being here, particularly my new employer, Forest Research. And hopefully we still have some time for questions. Sorry, Kieran, I went on a bit long.